We're delighted to be joined by evangelist and author Tony Brown. Tony, how did you become interested in what Mormons believe and what was your first introduction to Mormonism? Yeah, well, I think my first sort of uh, introduction to Mormonism was just seeing them on the streets and, and in the city centre and thinking, who are these people? Obviously, coming from a Jehovah's Witness background myself, I, I knew they knocked on doors, but I thought, who are these who are these other guys that are knocking on doors as well? Uh, so I began to read up about them and get interested in them, met some Mormon missionaries um, and were very confused by them. Uh, they, they appeared to believe the same as, as I did. Everything I said, they seemed to agree with. Uh, really honest, nice guy. So it really made me sort of think, what, who are these people and where they're coming from? And so, yeah, I just began to to read about Mormonism and and uh, ended up discovering that um, it's very different to the Christianity that uh, I believe in practice. Yeah. Well, they're, they're known as some other names. Tell us about their history and how they come about. Yeah, well, the Mormons, they don't like to be called Mormons now. Um, so it's always been a nickname as Mormons and obviously comes from the Book of Mormon. Um, but uh, I think it was about four years ago now. Um, the the now president or prophet of the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, to give them their full title, um, said that they're no no longer to use the word Mormon. So they got rid of the word Mormon completely from all their websites, their literature, not the Book of Mormon, of course, but um, because they said it's a nickname. That's not what God has called us. So they like to be called the Church of Jesus Christ as their shortened name. Um, LDS is acceptable, which is, is Latter Day Saints. So the, the Latter-day Saints uh, began in 19th century America, as many of the, of the groups we encountered did. Uh, there was a man named Joseph Smith. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believed that the Christian church became apostate uh, rather quickly um, after the death of the, the final apostle. And became so apostate that when it got to 19th century America, there was no true Christianity around anymore. And uh, this young man named Jesus, Joseph Smith, uh, they believe um, God used to restore um, historic biblical Christianity. Um, so the history of, of the church is inextricably linked with this guy, Joseph Smith. Um, I'll tell you more about him in, in a little while. But um, here's a quote from a guy who was the, uh, the 10th prophet of the LDS church, a guy called Joseph Fielding Smith. He said this. Mormonism, as it is called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly appointed and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds this world has ever seen. There is no middle ground. Yeah. So There's an interesting quote from one of their own prophets. So everything about the, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, its beginnings, what it believes and everything, is all bound in the person of Joseph Smith. Uh, so I'll tell you more about him as, as we go through. Yeah, you said that one of your first encounters, uh, meeting some Mormons, that you found that you had a lot in common with them. What what are the core beliefs of Mormonism? So um, they're they're really really interesting group. I mean, for a start, they they use the Bible. It's always the King James version of the Bible. Um, they they usually carry around with them um, either something called a triple or a quad, as the name um, suggest the name suggests. Um, a triple has got three lots of uh, scripture in there. A quad's got four. So the, the, the core beliefs is that there are there are four lots of scripture. Um, there's the King James Version of the Bible. There's the Book of Mormon. There's something called Doctrine and Covenants. And then a smaller um, book called the Pearl of Great Price. They see those as authoritative. That's a core belief. They're all standard works. And then they have the, the teachings of the prophets as well which they see as, as scripture. So they're, they're core beliefs. And from those sources come some of the things that believe. But I mean, the ultimate belief for Mormons is that we, we are, are alive on this planet to progress. Progression is a big word for them. They believe that at one time we lived with Heavenly Father as his spirit children, and uh, we come to the earth to progress. And we progress ultimately by being Mormons and going through all the laws and ordinances and teachings of the Mormon church. Uh, and the, the, the great plan or the core belief in Mormonism is that we need to do all that we need to do to return back to Heavenly Father. So that's that's the core belief. Now, obviously, within that is, is all kinds of teachings and beliefs that aids 
our progression through this life to return back to Heavenly Father. But that's that's ultimately what they're teaching and believing. Yeah. You mentioned the founder, Joseph Smith. Mm. He has an interesting history starting at when he was 14 years old, when he was looking for a church to join. Tell us about that, Tony. Yeah, well, Joseph Smith, the story goes that Joseph Smith, when he was around about 14 years old, um, was asking that very question, you know, which church should I join? Um, I mean, Joseph Smith was born in a place called Sharon in Vermont, um, which in, in 1805, he moved with his family to uh, a New York state, state uh, place called Palmyra. And that was known as the Burnt Over District. The Burnt Over District, because there's so many Christian revivals there, so much activity happening. And he claims that when he got to 14, there was so much of this stuff happening. He didn't know which of these groups to join. So his story is that he he read his Bible. He read uh, James 1, verse 5, which says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So he thought, I'm going to ask God which of these groups I should join. And he goes out into the woods, into what they call the sacred grove. And... um, and it's there that he has an encounter with um, with with Heavenly Father and uh, with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And this is a classic example of people going astray, seeking extra biblical revelation right from God. Tell, tell us about what happened next then. Sorry. Yes. So he, he apparently this is called the first vision in Mormonism. It's called yeah. the first vision because there's there's actually nine first visions, would you believe? Um this is the official account that I'm going to share with you now. The others sort of contradict each other a little bit. But the first vision, first vision really is that the Heavenly Father and the Son appeared to Joseph Smith in that secret gro- sacred grove. And Joseph Smith asked them, which of all these groups should he join? So he was confused about that. And this is his response. He said, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines, the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So right there at the very beginning, this 14 year old boy is claiming that God told him that he's to join none of these groups because all of their creeds were an abomination to him. Yeah. All their professors were corrupt. So right from its beginnings, Mormonism has been antagonistic towards other churches and other forms of Christianity, believing themselves to be the true uh, Christian church. What happened after that, during the 1820s and 1830s, uh, sorry, up to 1830, Joseph Smith was visited by um, uh, the angel Moroni, um, you see the angel Moroni on top of Mormon temples blowing his trumpet. The angel Moroni told him about some gold plates that had been buried um, years back in the ancient Americas. He was led to these gold plates. He dug them up. They were in a language that he couldn't understand called Reformed Egyptian. Um, no one could understand it because nobody had ever heard of Reformed Egyptian before. But it, the story goes that along with the uh, these gold plates were two uh, what they call seer stones, peep stones. He called them the Urim and Thummim. And apparently through using these peep stones, looking through these peep stones, he could um, interpret what was written on the gold plates. And he, as he did that, as he recited what he saw, um, a, a friend of his um, wrote down what Joseph Smith was telling him, and that became the Book of Mormon. And um, so... What, what they end up saying is that the early church was completely apostate and through the Book of Mormon and through Joseph Smith, there was a restoration of true Christianity. And they believe themselves to, to be the true Christians. Today, we, we obviously have a closed canon of scripture. Mm. What well, Why is direct revelation so dangerous? I mean, we even see that ourselves within some Christian denominations, right, where there's an emphasis yeah. on here. Yeah. How, how is this so dangerous? Yeah, well, it's incredibly dangerous, isn't it? Because this is how all these groups begin, really, with someone saying they have extra biblical revelation. For these guys, the Bible is never enough. Where you and I would say that we, we have a close canon, that, that we have all that we need in Scripture. We don't need anything else. We want to hear from God. Uh, we read the Bible. 
I think uh, Justin Peters says, if you want to hear audibly from God, then read it out loud, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, and but these guys, yeah, it's dangerous because they go off and they hear all kinds of things. And sadly, as you pointed out, this is not just within the cultic groups. This is happening within the Christian church as well. But but yeah, these guys believe that there's extra biblical revelation. There's more than the Bible. And so they seek after um, extra, extra revelation. And Mormonism is full of extra biblical revelation. Uh, through their writings, through Joseph Smith particularly, um, but also through their, their living prophets today. Um, although it's it's less new revelation today, um, it's become less and less as time has gone on, actually distinct new revelation. But all that Joseph Smith and, and certainly his predecessor, Brigham Young, taught was very much new revelation, taking them away from biblical truth. So tell us about these modern day prophets and what are they what are they doing now? Who are they and where are they? How many have they got? What, what's going on? Yeah, well, they have one sort of person who they claim to be the living prophet. So guys, today it's a 97 year old guy called Russell M. Nelson. They're always old guys because the guy that replaces the guy that, that was the prophet is the next senior. So they're always old guys. Um, but he's seen as the living prophet. So he can declare something new, new revelation. He directs the church. He speaks for God. He has people around him who are also prophetic and they work together prophetically and can declare revelation. But ultimately, they believe that the, 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 the living prophet is the one that brings about revelation. Um, so Mormon prophets and apostles are distinct, a distinct characteristic of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, really. Um, they believe that the, the, the apostles and the prophets were really restored with Joseph Smith and and Brigham Young, and then all the presidents of the church that followed after them were all um, living prophets um, in the same manner as said Abraham and Moses and Isaiah, the apostles in the day of Jesus. And so they're, they're really, really important to, um, to Mormonism. They believe that when the church became apostate, when the final apostle died, uh, those apostles and prophets should have continued in the church, but they didn't. And so they were restored through joseph smith back in 19th century america and again as you've already pointed out sadly there are people in the christian church today who also believe that apostles and prophets have been restored to the church and are bringing about extra revelation so um, in, in that sense they're very much like the mormon church yeah some mormons are taught that adam was god how do they understand that to be the case yeah i think it's important that you said there some uh, because many would deny that this is the this is the problem with Mormonism. Mormons are very different from Jehovah's Witnesses. So I, I once heard this said, and I think it's so true, that if you ask a Jehovah's Witness, uh, sorry, 10 Jehovah's Witnesses the same question, you'll get pretty much 10 identical answers. If you ask 10 Mormons the same question, you'll get 15 different answers because the, the, there's lots of contradictory stuff in Mormonism, depending on where they go and who they believe. There's, there's a lot of states. So there's many Mormons will say, no, we do not believe that Adam was God. Uh, I mean, the idea of this came from Brigham Young, the second prophet of the Mormon church, the guy who followed Joseph Smith. He taught that Adam, the first man, was God the father. But uh, I mean, subsequent sort of Mormons, have, some have agreed with that, some have distanced themselves from that. Um, I think the current modern Latter-day Saints don't believe that teaching. Um, and um, so it's, it's difficult for them when someone who they claim was a prophet, like Brigham Young, says these things and puts them in a difficult situation where they end up having to say, actually, we don't believe that. Yeah, but yeah. such as, as Mormonism, that the, the, the living prophet, the newer prophet can contradict the older prophet or change the teaching of the older prophet. And so it's confused. So, yeah, it, was, it came from Brigham Young, the idea that Adam was uh, God the Father in the flesh. Um, but I think most Mormons would deny that or not believe that today. Yeah. There's a claim that there are more than 15 million Mormons around the world today, many of which are engaged with evangelism. When Christians come into contact with a Mormon, what are some helpful ways to engage and challenge them on their unbiblical beliefs? Yeah, well, I think um, the way we're going to see Mormon evangelism is through their missionaries, um, ultimately, because missionaries are, are usually young men, young women, who give um, for, for the young men, it's two years for the for the women, it's 18 months of their lives to serve a mission. 
they grow up believing that they've got to serve a mission, particularly the men. Um, it, it's frowned upon if you don't serve a mission um, within the Mormon culture. So these guys are missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, identified often by the badges that they wear. So that's who we're going to see. And when we see these guys, I think first and foremost, I would suggest that we be very nice and loving and kind towards them. Not because we agree with anything they teach, but because you imagine this, um, young guys, young women, thousands of miles away from home, usually um, missing their family, their parents, all their friends. They have limited contact with their loved ones back home. And they're suddenly thrust into this weird culture even if they come to the uk you know they're maybe american they come to the uk we're very different to how they see things so i often are very nice and loving ask them about their family ask them you know if they always knew they were going to become a missionary what they hoped they were going to get from their mission how far they're into their mission i will often offer that to buy them something um it's a little bit naughty but i always said you fancy meeting me in a coffee shop which is a bit naughty because mormons don't drink tea or coffee um uh, but they love hot chocolate. I've discovered that. So I'll often offer to sort of take them somewhere, buy them something. They're often on a limited budget. So I think the way we act towards them in the first instance can speak volumes to these guys. Yeah. So being lo loving and, and gracious towards them. And then I think as you befriend them and, and they will be more keen to meet with you again, more than Jehovah's Witnesses are. Jehovah's Witnesses are very suspicious if you want to meet again, unless you, you, know, you don't reveal much to them. The Mormons love it uh, because they, they want to convert you. Ultimately, that's their job. And so if you meet with them again, you can then begin to um, ask them questions about what they believe. And again, I think questions are the way to go with these guys rather than saying, well, I read this book by this guy called Tony or I heard this uh, podcast by this guy called Tony and he said, you believe this. So what do you believe about this? What do you believe about Jesus? Who do you believe God to be? What do you believe scripture to be? Because they will differ. In, in their views. And again, they're just young people who will not have a lot of life experience, won't know, won't know all the answers. Um, but questions like, you know, what must I do to be saved um, is, a, is a good question that then begins to unpack their, their gospel of, of, you know, you need to be worthy to be, to be saved. They mean something different by saved as well. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But, you know, what, are, what, do, what do I need to do to get right with Heavenly Father? Um, you know, what hope do you have of eternal life? Because all these guys in these groups do not have uh, assurance. They just hope they're doing enough um, to, to be saved. I think a question as well, and we'll maybe get onto this a little bit more later, is, you know, um, how can Jesus and, and Lucifer be spirit brothers? Because that's something they believe. They believe that Jesus and Lucifer were actually spirit brothers in the pre-existence uh before jesus came to earth you know and, and how does that fit in with scripture you know colossians 1 16 and 17 says that jesus created everything so surely he created lucifer how is he a spirit brother so it's just questions to get them think uh, um, you know i always talk about we need to put a stone in their shoe um rather than convert them we, we just want to ask them questions that's going to make them think and trouble them and again i've got a host of questions and stuff and dialogue you can have with Mormon missionaries uh, should anybody want to get in touch with me. Yeah. And just quickly, Tony, how, how do people get that? So what, what is what is that via email? Yeah, if you just email me, um, I'm going to share my email at the end of, of, of our discussion today. Uh, get in touch with me. I'll, I'll, I'll send you questions you can ask them, uh, things you can ask them about the Book of Mormon, about salvation, about the Lord Jesus, things that will get them thinking. Um because they, you know, ultimately these guys are, are limited in their knowledge somewhat, uh, because they're only just young guys, just starting out. But there'll be certain things they do know, yeah. and um, things we can share with them can open up fruitful discussion that can lead them to to, to a realization that they need to put their trust fully in the Lord Jesus and what He's done. Yeah, that'd be really helpful. Thank you, Tony. Mormons are known to perform proxy baptisms for dead people. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a little bit weird, isn't it? Uh, they don't reveal that to you very quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, Mormons believe uh, that people can be saved post-mortem. And so they have what they call a plan of salvation, which if you meet with the Mormon missionaries, you can normally go through six sessions with them. 
usually in one of those sessions, maybe session four or five or something, they will they will bring out what they call the plan of salvation. And in the plan of salvation, they, they teach you that you too were once a spirit child, uh, offspring of Heavenly Father and one of his goddess wives. Um, you then come to earth to, to progress, to live out your mortality, as they call it. And then after that, if you die um, a Mormon, um, you will go to a place in the afterlife in the spirit world called paradise. If you die and you're not Mormon, you go to a place in the spirit world um, uh, which is called spirit prison. Uh, but even while you're in spirit prison, you can't escape those pesky Mormon missionaries because apparently they go there too. And there you can receive the Mormon gospel in spirit prison. But in order for you to progress from spirit prison up to paradise and then continue on an upward journey in the next life, um, you need to be baptized. Baptism is essential in, in Mormon theology for salvation. And apparently there's no water in spirit prison. What are the odds? And so if you accept the Mormon gospel in spirit prison, in order for you to move up to paradise, you need to be baptized. So someone must get baptized in place of you. And so in their temples, they have baptism for the dead. It's said that if you want to research your genealogy, your family history, the best place to go is the Mormon church because they've done all that stuff for you. Because they're constantly getting baptized for the dead in Mormon temples. They do research uh, into uh, ancestry. And so they claim to have been baptized for all kinds of people like Princess Diana, Napoleon Bonaparte. I don't know. You, you name it. They claim they've been baptized. So when you get to spirit prison, if you accept the Mormon gospel and someone gets baptized for you in the temple, those two things come together and you're removed from spirit prison and you find yourself in paradise and you're able to progress in the next life. Wow. So, I mean, they'll claim it's biblical. You know, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, 28, 29, are the verses they take you to. Yeah. Paul's defending the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection from the dead. He says, if it's not true, what about those who got baptized for the dead? Just a few interesting things just to point out in those verses there. You should never just pull a verse out of its context and build a doctrine, which they've done. Yeah. That's very dangerous. Um, but Paul seems to be speaking about someone other than the Christians at that point. He says, what about, you know, speaking about us. And then he says, but what about those who, them who, uh, uh, or maybe like an offshooty group? Um, it's never been practiced in the early church. It's not taught about anywhere else as being salvific or, or, any, or anybody being baptized for the dead. So we think it's just a spurious verse that Paul's talking about. Some people there that were doing that, he's by no means promoting that. But the Mormons have taken that verse and said, there you go. And, and so they get baptized for, for dead people. Very, yeah. very, very strange, but that's what they're doing. It's, it's usually young people that go into the temple. And I don't know for how, how, many, how long they do it, but they do it for a good number. There's just a guy there baptizes you in the name of. You know, David Knight in the name of, Tony Brown in the name of. And so, yeah, we will be baptised for in the Mormon temple. So there's people walking around that have literally been baptised tens, if not hundreds of times. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, so they want to make sure that if you if you die and you're not a Mormon and you end up in spirit prison, and I don't know about you, David, if I, if I die and I end up in somewhere called spirit prison, and I'm visited by Mormon missionaries, I might be tempted to listen to those guys because I think well, maybe they're onto something. But we know that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, there's no um, chance of salvation after death. You know, the Bible says it's for a man once to die and after that is judgment. So these guys are giving um, false hope, really. Um, but yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, wow. Well. How does the Book of Mormon interact with the Bible? And what do they believe as the authority between all of these books? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Mormons believe that the, the Bible and the Book of Mormon are both... Um, scriptures um, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately. They'll, they'll sometimes take you to a verse in Ezekiel 37. Um, I think it's verses 15 to 17, where it talks about two sticks. It says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel associated with him associated with him and join them one to another into one stick that may, be, may become one in your hand. 
they've been taught that the two sticks speaking about there is the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Well, of course, historically, contextually, it's nothing at all to do with the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Ezekiel's not making any kind of prediction about separate written revelations of God. Uh, the context shows that they're speaking about the reuniting of a remnant of Judah and Israel, uh, that these were the two sticks that would become one. But So sometimes they, they go there because they've been told that that's what they mean. But it's interesting what they believe about the Bible because the, the Mormon church have articles of faith. And Article 8 of the LDS faith says this, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. So what's that, that saying is the Book of Mormon is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God, but only as far as it's translated correctly. Yeah, if you were to ask Mormon missionaries, well, where does the Bible correct wrongly? You know, where, where is it incorrect in its translation? They, they can't take you anywhere because they don't know the answer to that. It, it just seems to be that wherever you show them a verse from the Bible, which seems to contradict Mormon doctrine, they'll yeah. then question whether it's been translated correctly in those places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what they believe. So, so more authority is given to uh, the Book of Mormon than the Bible. Yeah. And you've also mentioned I mean, it, another book. I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry, go on, sorry. sorry. Please come on. I was just going to say that, that yeah, the Book of Mormon and the Bible will agree in places. Um, and, and you can show them places where, where it agrees uh, because a large, a large chunk of the Book of Mormon has just been lifted from the Bible anyway and placed in the Book yeah. of Mormon. Yeah. So there are places where it will agree. Um, but in agreeing together, it, they will end up contradicting Mormon doctrine because Mormon doctrine doesn't come from the Bible and it doesn't come from the Book of Mormon. It comes from the teachings of Joseph Smith, particularly in Doctrine and Covenants. So, yeah. You've also mentioned another book, um, the, the Pearl of Great Price. What's that all yeah. about? So, yeah. The, the, so the Doctrine and Covenants is, is the teachings usually of Joseph Smith. It's a little bit like the Hadith in, 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 in Islam, you know, where a lot of what they believe comes from the prophet or prophets. Uh, ultimately and it's the the doctrine and covenants is the same it's like the teachings of joseph smith particularly a little bit of brigham young and then a few other of the prophets so that's where they get a lot of their doctrine the pearl of great price as well is an interesting sort of uh, book really i mean the first edition of the pearl of great price was published in 1851 and at that time it contained some of the doctrine that's now been placed into the doctrine and covenants but um the, the pearl of great prices they have it today has excerpts of Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis, uh, uh, now called the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. He's got some of his translation of Matthew 24, um, now called Matthew in, in, in their translation. Um, he has uh, Joseph Smith's translation of uh, Egyptian uh, pap papyrus, uh, which is now called the Book of Abraham, which has been proved to be false completely. Uh, and an excerpt from Joseph Smith's History of the Church that he wrote in 1838 called Joseph Smith History. And then he has the 13 statements, the 13 articles of faith of the LDS Church. So that's what's in the Pearl of Great Price. So there's a mishmash of all kinds of things in there. Some they, they give more authority to than others. They tend to stay away from the Book of Abraham because it's been proved to be fraudulent completely. Um, but, yeah, they do see it as scripture. This might be a really obvious question based on everything you've already said, but the LDS church would claim to be a part of a wider Christian tradition. Why must this be flatly refused by Bible believing Christians? Yeah, because of everything I've said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, though they use Christian language, um, though they want to be seen as, a, as a, another Christian denomination, they're definitely not Christians when you get down to their doctrine. Because ultimately, our doctrine defines who we are, whether we're really believers in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. That's where it, the, the, the rub of the road is. And But for, for Mormons, they've spent a lot of time and effort, particularly in the last 40, 50 years, trying to be seen as, as another denomination. So, for example, it wasn't until 1984 that the Book of Mormon, which I've got a copy of here, um, had the tagline in 1984 you had the tagline added another testament of jesus christ that makes them sound more christian it's got the word jesus christ on it 
Mormons on their badges have the Church of Jesus Christ. Well, we're Christians. We follow Jesus Christ. Um, they are adamant that they're Christians. They're, they're adamant that they're just another denomination. They acknowledge that they're, they're not traditional Christianity in some of the things that they teach, but they see themselves as, as having the right of being seen as Christians. Um, but they're far, far, far removed from historical, orthodox, biblical Christianity. You see, I think 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, what the Apostle Paul says here is very fitting for a lot of these groups, but particularly for Mormons. As the Apostle Paul said, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, the Mormons have another Jesus. Yeah. If someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And I think the Mormons have a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. So they're not Bible-believing Christians by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I would argue when you look at their, their teachings and, and how and their practice, they're far closer to Islam than they are to yeah. biblical Christianity. Yeah, wow. Wow. And, and to be clear, crystal clear, you know, this is these aren't arguments about secondary things, you know, the mode of baptism or infant baptism. We're talking no. about a completely different gospel where it's impossible to be saved because they've got a different Christ, right? Yeah, absolutely right, David. I mean, it's, it's good that you pointed that out because I think it's these are not yeah peripheral issues. They're not side issues that we just disagree upon. Um, these are these are the core uh, tenets of, of, of Christian belief, historical Christian belief that they deny pretty much every single one of them. What do they believe about the Godhead, Tony? Yeah, well, here we go with, with straight away where they have a different view of God. I mean, um, sometimes you've got to be careful with Mormons. I've already pointed out. If you said you believe in the Trinity, I've had some Mormons say yes. Um, but they, they don't believe in the Trinity as we understand the Trinity. And the term they would normally use is Godhead rather than Trinity. But for Mormons, the Godhead, uh, well, first of all, we, we believe the Trinity to be one God in three persons the godhead in mormonism is three separate gods so they're tritheistic uh, indeed they, they, they end up being polytheistic because they believe others can be god as well yeah. so the godhead for mormons consists of heavenly father who is a god his firstborn son jesus who is also a god and the spirit son holy spirit who is also a god in his own right so the godhead consists of three gods so, again, that's already stepping outside of biblical Christianity because we're monotheistic. There's one God revealed in three persons. They have three gods. They also believe that they, too, the men within Mormonism, can progress so far that they, too, can become a god. And they believe there are gods on other planets, just doing the same thing that's happening on Earth here. So you see it's, it's polytheistic in its beliefs. So that's very not uh, biblical Christianity. Yeah, yeah. They believe that God was once created by another God who was then created by another God. And it goes on. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, again, this is just weird, isn't it? But, um, you know, where did Heavenly Father come from? Well, he at one time lived out his plan of salvation on another planet that was ruled by a different God. Where does that God come from? Well, he once lived out his plan of salvation on another planet. And so it goes on ad infinitum. There's no starting point. I mean, they, they believe, they don't believe... Um, Creation ex nihilo, for example, creation out of nothing. They believe that um, matters always existed, that, um, you know, everything's always existed. And, and so you go far back, you, you can't get to a starting point anywhere where you have a God that wasn't created, um, who then began the creation process. Um, and they believe, one of the things that they believe is this, and this was a, a little saying brought about by the fourth prophet of the Mormon church, a guy called Lorenzo Snow. He said, this is called the Mormon couplet. He said, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. So when you really think about that, he's saying that the, the God that Mormons claim to worship, Heavenly Father, was once a sinful man on another planet. He was once a sinful man who became God. And this God now, man may become. We're sinful men. We too can progress to become a God ourselves. Yeah. So, again, that's just so far outside of biblical Christianity. It's unbelievable. Uh, but, yeah, these Mormon missionaries, the guys, uh, not, the, not the gals, the, 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 the women believe that they could become goddesses 
But basically, in the future, they're just baby making machines on another planet. Um, the men can become gods. Yeah. So that's it's, what it's they believe. Isn't it? It's disturbing, isn't it, Tony? Because we've mentioned before about how these things can seep into Christianity. Mm. You know, we were talking about revelation, wasn't we? You know, direct revelation from God. You know, the little God. Uh, yeah. You know, teaching has crept in, and, and there's some prosperity teachers that are teaching that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, modalism, uh, again, uh, yeah. uh, you know, that's being taught by some really popular, you know, teachers. If you go onto Amazon, some of the best selling, you know, all Christian, so-called Christian authors are teaching these heresies. It's dangerous how these things can creep into the church, right? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, David. And, and I think, you know, I spend a, a good chunk of my time now talking about these things in the church. Um, you know, so I, I, I've done some teaching recently on the New Apostolic Reformation and the Prosperity Gospel. Progressive Christianity is a big thing as well at the moment, and and these same things, yeah, they're not they're not new. Um, this stuff in the church, they've always been there, right back in the early church. We were warned in, in the Bible itself about false prophets, false teachings, heresies coming in, but these things are just repackaged, and people buy into them again, and so all these things can be found in the church. Yeah, and who, I mean, who was it? The Bible does say that you can be a God, you can be like God. But who was it that said that? Well, it was Satan that said that. You know, and, and so, yeah, there are people believing they're little gods, there are people denying the deity of Christ, the, the triune nature of God. And these are the popular teachers in our church today. And so, yeah, we need to be aware of that. So as we're talking about moments at the moment, there'll be people that hear this and think, yeah, but I know I know a Christian teacher that teaches this. So I go to a church that teaches that. Yes. And that's a common experience I, I hear when I when I teach about these things. Yeah, yeah. it's really helpful. Thank you. W what do Mormons believe about Jesus? Well, again, you're going to find here that they have a very different Jesus than the biblical Jesus. So, I mean, they believe that Jesus really is the offspring of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And he was the first born child of heavenly father and heavenly mother. And so he was a spirit child of heavenly father, heavenly mother. That's how he came into existence. Uh, but he is just one of many, many spirit children. So as I've already said, they believe Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. But when you challenge them with that, they'll say, yeah, but we're spirit children of heavenly father as well. So we're, we're all spirit brothers and sisters. Um, so that's the Jesus that they believe in, a spirit child. And what they believe is in the pre-existence, Heavenly Father um, had a council, a gathering of, of himself, a council of the gods, they call it. So I don't know whether there were other gods there or whatever, but all the spirit children were there. And he wanted to decide on a plan of salvation for the earth. And Jesus came up with a plan. And Lucifer came up with a plan. And Jesus' plan was adopted. Um, Jesus' plan was to come and die, live a, a, a sinless life, and then die um, for the salvation of the world. His plan was adopted. Lucifer's rejected. Lucifer uh, takes his bat and ball home um, and decides he don't want anything to do with it anymore. That's where he becomes Satan, the devil. And a third of the spirit children that were there agreed with Lucifer and his plan. So they were the demons. Um, there was a, a core of people there as well who sat on the fence and didn't agree with Jesus or Lucifer as a punishment. Heavenly Father said to those who were sitting on the fence, when you're born into mortality, when you come to the earth, you're going to be punished. And your punishment is you're going to be born black. So racism is inherent within Mormonism and its system. Wow. Uh, but Jesus comes to the earth to be the savior of the world. But they believe he was just a man who lived. They believed he he really took the uh, the punishment. The atonement really took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, not on the cross. They believe that Jesus dying on the cross was almost like a, an afterthought, a mistake. Um, you know, that Satan um, ended up putting him on the cross. Uh, but he didn't need to go to the cross because the real atonement took place in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating drops of blood. Hence, they don't have any crosses in their churches. They don't wear crosses. There's no t crosses on their temples. Uh so they deny the role of the cross in the atonement. So that, that was the Jesus. Jesus then continued being a good Mormon, <laughs> uh, continued his plan, the plan of salvation, post-mortem, and he too becomes a God as well alongside 
um, Heavenly Father. Yeah, that's the Jesus of Mormonism. It's interesting to know, isn't it, Tony? Because you mentioned at the front of the interview that when you first met, if you know, your first um, contact with Mormons was very much this rapport building stage where there was so mm. much that you agreed on. And, yeah, and, it, and it's it's in, it's in, it's important to know that, isn't it? Because you might end up initially having a conversation with a Mormon, thinking, "Wow, we've got so much in common," but to then see how far away yeah, this yeah. ends up is just on another planet, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's part of part of what they do. You know, they 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 want to be seen as Christians, so they'll use all the same language, all the same terms. I mean, I've known David. Christian churches allow Mormons to meet in their church because they just think they're another Christian denomination. You go to a, a Mormon meeting, they'll sing some of the hymns that we sing. They use familiar language. And so in that, you don't really know. That's why it's really important to, to unpack things with these guys. Because none of these groups, whoever, whichever cultic group we speak about, they're never going to reveal all this stuff right from the off. Because if they do, who, who on earth would ever join them? Yeah. You know, they don't. It's when you're you're in that you start to get these things revealed to you. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and then you become accepting of them. Yeah. What role does good works play in Mormonism? Yeah, well, he plays every he plays every sort of role in Mormonism, really. They, I mean, they believe that you have to produce good works um, to ultimately get back to Heavenly Father. And I make a distinction there because when we talk about salvation, in, in Mormonism, everybody's saved. Um, you're all going to be saved to somewhere. Um, and we'll unpack that more in a moment. But they believe in exaltation as well. That is where you can go and live with Heavenly Father in the future with the potential of becoming God. And if you want to be exalted, you want to receive exaltation, then, yeah, there's work to be done. And the work comes from Mormon doctrine. But I, I'll just give you a, a, a verse here, a verse that they... They um, can be sure it's 2 Nephi 25, 23. And I, I'm going to miss a little bit off um, to begin with. It says this, it says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved. Now, if I was to stop there, you think that sounds very much like the Bible. It sounds like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, uh, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But it doesn't end there. This is how it ends. It says for, in 2 Nephi 25, 23, it says, For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So for Mormons, grace only kicks in when they've done everything they can do. And, of course, you can always do more. You know, I say to Mormon missionaries, how long did you pray before you went out this morning? You know, whatever time they say, they might say 20 minutes. I'll say, well, couldn't you have done more? You know, how many people did he speak to today? Well, maybe 10. Uh, is that all? Couldn't you have done more? Because that verse seems to say grace only kicks in when you've done all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And you can always do more. So yeah. in reality, grace never kicks in for these guys. It's all about them. It's all about effort. It's all about good works um, to, to get to exaltation. And it's interesting. We we know that the gospel means good news, and that doesn't sound yeah. much like good news, is it, Tony? But so no, no, is, not for these guys. What is the gospel according to a Mormon, and and what do they actually believe that eternity looks like? You have touched on that, but just expand on that for us. Yeah, well, if you listen to Mormons, they'll talk about the gospel all the time. Mormon missionaries, you know, we're we're here to teach them the gospel, to preach the gospel. The gospel's changed my life, but the gospel means something very different to a Mormon than it means to us. Um. For Mormons, the gospel really is um, following the laws and ordinances of the Mormon church. Um, and that, by doing that, you can return to Heavenly Father. So the laws and ordinances of the Mormon church are, are, are many, numerous. It's like a big ladder you've got to climb up. Um, so imagine, you know, I, I talked earlier about uh, baptism for the dead, and you move from spirit prison to paradise. Well, then there's like, a ladder then from paradise up to the celestial kingdom. And these are all the laws and ordinances of the Mormon church. So some of the basic laws and ordinances would be, um, you know, do you sustain the leadership of the Mormon church? Do you believe that they're a prophet? Do you 
testify that Joseph Smith was a prophet? Do you tithe to the church? You know, do you uh, keep the word of wisdom, which is no drinking tea or coffee or alcohol? And, and there's a whole host of things that they've got to keep. And that for them is the, the Mormon gospel. So it's not really good news. It's hard work. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, um, so they, they believe that, you know, in eternity, we're going to spend eternity. Everyone's going to spend eternity in one of four places. This comes out when they go through the plan of salvation with you. Um, they believe that there, there are three kingdoms and then a fourth kingdom, which no one wants to go to. But the top kingdom is the celestial kingdom. And only faithful Mormons, Mormons who've been married in the temple, um, will reach the higher, higher echelons of the celestial kingdom. That's where Heavenly Father dwells. The likes of us, they'll say, well, you guys are Christians, but you're missing out on the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we have. So you're going to go to a middle kingdom, which they call the terrestrial kingdom. So in the terrestrial kingdom, apparently it's really lovely there and really nice. And, and we, we're going to be happy there, but the, we're going to be sad because Heavenly Father never visits there. Jesus apparently will visit us. He'll come down from the celestial kingdom, come down and spend a bit of time with us. So we get to see Jesus, but we never return to Heavenly Father. That's our punishment for not being Mormons. There's a bottom kingdom, the, the, the third tier, as it were, called the Telestial Kingdom. This is where people like bad people like Hitler's going to be there. Saddam Hussein's going to be there. The, the young guy that just shot the children in the school in America, he's going to be there. They're going to be there. There's going to be a sort of kind of punishment for them for a time, but then they're set free into the celestial kingdom, which, again, is an okay place to live and exist. Mm -hmm. But the punishment for you there is you're never going to see Jesus or Heavenly Father. So we're going to see Jesus. They're not going to see Jesus nor Heavenly Father. But then there's a final place, which we'd call hell. They call outer darkness. And outer darkness is reserved for, for Lucifer and those who followed him, but also for one other group of people. And the other group of people are apostate Mormons. So imagine you're a Mormon who comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You end up being on our side, trusting in the Bible, trusting in what Jesus did on the cross for salvation. The punishment for you for leaving Mormonism is um, out of darkness. And there it's just, yeah, well, it's just a place of hell. Um, they don't really describe what that place is like, as far as I understand but it's a place where you'll never see Heavenly Father, never see Jesus, never see your loved ones ever again. Um, it's just a place of, of hell. So isn't it interesting that the worst of the worst, often in these cultic groups, are those who've left them yeah. and become something else, even a faithful Christian serving the Lord Jesus. Worst place is left for you. Yeah. Some people may be surprised to hear of the links between Freemasonry and the occult. Tell us about that, Tony. Yeah, well, certainly Freemasonry is throughout uh, Mormon history. It's said that Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were Freemasons. It's said that, um, you know, when he when he lost his life, they claim he died a martyr. He was he was shot in a, in a prison by an angry mob. Uh, the final thing he did was some kind of Masonic sign with his hand, apparently. But um, I think you, the, the early temples in Mormonism were definitely um, modeled on the Masonic halls that he visited. And so within temples, even today, there are things like secret handshakes, um, symbols, uh, Masonic symbols, rituals, uh, aprons like the Masons wear used in, in Mormon temples. So a lot of, of what the Mormon temple was modeled upon was, was Freemasonry. Yeah. Um, you know, Bruce, uh, Joseph Smith and, and his father um, were both involved in, in an occult practice back in the day as well, known as money digging. They had special rituals and ceremonies that they performed with the purpose of obtaining buried treasure, thought to be guarded by evil spirits. It wasn't just those guys. There were a lot of people into that kind of stuff uh, in 19th century America as they were uh, money digging and looking for buried treasure. And they would use uh, these stones, uh, which I've already mentioned, um, which would lead them to buried treasure and stuff like that. But they were well known to sort of believe that, uh, you know, they, they needed spirits leading them to this, this treasure. So right again, from its, from its beginnings, there was occultic ideas and practice um, there. Um, that it's believed that, you know, in the Mormon temple um, and, and Mormons, I've heard Mormons testify to this, 
that spirits have visited them and, and come along, the dead come along and, and visit them. So a lot of occultic, dodgy practice. I've got to say, David, as well, that, um, you know, of all the people, you know, I've, I've tried to sort of reach, I felt the most occulty feeling, the un, feeling that there's something really not right and, 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 and a spiritual battle going along when I've, when I've been speaking to Mormons. And um, I remember once going to a, a Mormon church, a Mormon chapel, um, to meet some missionaries there. And I met a couple of other guys there as well. And one of them made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. And I could sense there was something just not right with this guy at, at all. I mean, I once met a Mormon guy, again, in a Mormon chapel, who he told me that he was brought up Mormon, but he left in his late teens, early 20s, and really got into the occult. Um, to new age practice, uh, tarot cards, everything, all that kind of stuff. But uh, his, his testimony was that one of these spirits um, told him, that these sp spirits that visited him told him that he should go back to the Mormon church because the Mormon church was the true church. And so he ended up back in the Mormon church. And he said, wow, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. So there's a lot of occulty you know, spiritistic practice um, goes on within Mormonism and particularly within their temple. They also have um, sort of, you know, sort of, let's say, when we know we've mentioned baptisms for the dead within the Mormon church and uh, visitations from all kinds of spirits and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there you go. Um, lots of lots of interesting stuff. You don't have to have been a Christian for long to pick up the language and start speaking Christianese, if yeah. you like, Tony. Um, and, and like you've mentioned as well, it's it's incredible and also very dangerous that you can be saying the same words, but meaning very different things. Well, what are some of the, the bits of language that we need to watch out for when speaking to Mormons that, that do significantly mean different things to what we believe? Yeah, well, you're actually right, David. You know, the Christmas... Uh... Christian language is used by the Mormons. The Mormons, I have to say, Mormons will speak Christianese, but they interpret it in Mormonese. And yeah. so they, everything, I would say everything that they say, and like you say, if you just meet Mormon missionaries for the first time, they will um, they will sound like they're Christians. And if you say, do you, whatever you say, do you believe in? They'll say, yeah. You know, do you believe Jesus is God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died for our sin? Yes. Do you believe in grace? Yes. Do you believe the Trinity? Yes. You, you, whatever you say, yes, 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 yes. So I think every time you speak to these guys, when they use words that are familiar to us, you need to say, can you tell me what you mean by that? And I think this is good practice, not only with the Mormons, but with all these, these cultic groups. So, you know, if you get somebody saying, well, I believe in the Trinity, so, well, what is the Trinity? Tell me what you think the Trinity is. And you'll often find that, yeah, they're talking modalism or something, um, you know, or, or, or three gods or something. And to get them to unpack that, very much you need to do this with the Mormons. If, every word they use, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And then they'll begin to reveal, um, yeah, what they really believe. And that, and that tip can actually also be very useful in discipling Christians as well, mm. like we oh, mentioned yeah. earlier on, right? Because, again, we can pick up language and without realising we can start using these words and, and give off the impression that we actually have, you know, have, have got a, a real understanding of what the gospel is. But it's good to test that sometimes, right? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think in, in, in times past, Christians would have used like a catechesis uh, as a way of understanding things, you know, and, and, and I think it's a really useful tool, you know. So, you know, the, the question is asked and then you explain what that means. And I think there's a lot of Christians today are not really into doctrine, not really reading their Bible, maybe going to a church that's a bit liberal or woolly in some way and prosperity minded or whatever. And they're just not being taught stuff. So it's so easy to be caught out by these guys in the cults. But, yeah, within the church as well, what do we believe? But why do we believe it? It's just as important. It's not enough to say in the Mormons, well, I, be I believe in the Trinity. And they say, well, why? Or what does that mean? So, well, I don't know, but my pastor says it's true. Yeah, you know, yeah, we need to be able yeah. to explain what we mean by these things and why we believe it. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. And what are some final tips for engaging with Mormons? Tony, you fired us up. We're, we're now raring to go. What, what, what should we be going to say to these guys? 
and girls. Yeah, well, I think I think there are some sort of g- general sort of things um, which are helpful uh, for me. You know, where possible, I try to use things that will help the discussion. So, you know, if if using a King James version with these guys will help them because that's the version they use, and and you find you can use that, then use the King James version with them. Uh, it's you know the, the, they're used to the King James language. They pray these young Mormon missionaries you know come from america they're praying king james english it's just a bizarre thing so you know use the king james where possible when speaking about god i try to say heavenly father because that's helpful to them um that's who we're talking about uh, i try to say lds rather than mormon again just because it's more helpful to them don't want to wind them up i'm not there to wind them up uh, yeah. so they're yeah. happy with lds you know how long have you been lds it's easy to say that I've already mentioned that it's important for us to uh, know what we believe and why we believe it. If you're engaging anybody in these groups, you need to better defend your position. Ask questions rather than uh, make statements. I think it's helpful, especially with these guys. You know, what what do you understand by the term Trinity? Uh, who do you understand Jesus to be? Because, again, within Mormonism, they'll have different views. So draw out of them what, what they believe, and then it helps us to proceed from there. But I think with these young guys as well, um, we need to focus on grace, forgiveness. You know, they're, um, they're, they're just young, young people, generally just trying to um, fulfill what their culture's told them is true. And, and Mormonism is a culture. It's not just a cult, it's a whole culture. Um, you know, the, the, their lives are mapped out for them. All their family, their friends, their future, their past is in the Mormon culture. So it's a massive thing for them to come out. It's costly for them to come out. So, yeah, be kind, graceful, loving towards them, but challenge them. And like I say, you know, if you if you email me, I can give you questions to ask them, things you can share with them, things you can point them to um, that will will hopefully help them. But, yeah, just just get befriend these guys. These guys will let you befriend them. So so befriending them and then and then challenge them with the reality of, of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. Thank you, Tony. I know you've written a book that's going to be coming out um, mm. soon. Tell us a little bit about that and how can people keep up to date with all of your work and to support you? Yeah, so uh, you may be aware that I've already written the book, Sharing the Gospel with Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, 10 of those have now got my my manuscripts for Sharing the Gospel with Mormons. So that will be coming out this year sometime. I'm not quite sure when. I mean, this is this is May, uh, end of May as we're speaking. Um, but they're, they're, they're well on with it, as far as I understand. I've also produced a little a tract to give out to Mormons um, based on a former Mormon's um, uh, testimony. Uh, so I've, I've had his permission and I've made it into a tract. Uh, that'd be really helpful. They're, they're likely to take that as well because it'll be interesting to them as missionaries. Um, that's coming out really soon, I, I understand. Uh, they try to get it out in terms of some Mormon mission we're going to do this summer. Um, they were going to have their UK pageant here in the, in the UK in, in August, at one of their temples in Chorley in Lancashire for two weeks. We'd planned some mission, uh, but sadly, they've, they've decided to uh, cancel that and have it next year instead. So it'll still be there for next year. And if you're interested in reaching out to Mormons, there's going to be thousands of Mormons flooding that area uh, August 2023. Uh, but yeah, just get in touch with me uh, via my email um, or, or via Reach Out Trust. So Reach Out Trust is uh, www.reachouttrust.org. You can send an email to Reach Out Trust, mention my name, it'll come to me. Or my, my personal email address is tony.brown at arv.org.uk. And uh, I'll send you information, uh, chat through things with you, and keep in touch with you, send you resources. Excellent, Tony. Thank you. I'm going to make sure that I've got the links um, to all of those things in the description below. So wherever you're listening, you'll be able to contact Tony and keep up to date with him. I'll also, as soon as there's a pre-order link to the book, I'll come and refresh and update this uh, description as well. So you'll be able to Brilliant. find that. Thank you so much. Hello, Tony, thanks again for all of your help and support. It's always great talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, really good to be with you, David. Thanks so much.